Hello, everyone, and welcome to NSTA Web Seminars, where you find live interactive learning at your desktop. My name is Flavio Mendez, and I will be moderating today's program. Emily Clements is online with us to provide technical support. Today's seminar is titled Science Updates, Do NASA Science Live? But before we begin, let's go over NSTA's virtual program norms. The National Science Teaching Association strongly supports diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom and in all of our programs. We are committed to providing a welcoming, safe, productive, harassment-free <laughs> environment for all participants of our events and programs, regardless of their gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, ethnicity, race, color, age, marital status, veteran status, socioeconomic status, or religion. We ask that all attendees be mindful of their surroundings and of their fellow participants. All participants are expected to exercise consideration and respect in their speech and actions and to refrain from demeaning, discriminatory or harassing behavior and speech. NSDA does not allow promotion of other products in our chats during web seminars. We ask that attendees keep the conversation on topic, use positive language and remain courteous of others throughout the event and allow everyone time to participate in the chat. And now it is my privilege to introduce our presenters. I'm gonna uh, share out their names and organizations and affiliations. And um, it is so that their desire to share more about themselves as they present. We have Amy Paddle from the Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden. Aaron Curtis representing NASA JPL. Nugent from uh, SciStarter. Chair at the University of New Mexico, and Mark Kirchner is at NASA Air Space Flight Center. Sending first is Jill Nugget. Welcome, Jill. Oh, thanks, Flavio. Thanks for having us. Oh, well, it's great to have you here. So we're going to hit now. Uh, will you turn uh, on your slides, please? Perfect. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, welcome everyone. We are thrilled to be here tonight. Um, welcome everyone. Glad that you're here. This is just a brief overview of tonight's agenda and it'll be all about 21st century space science. Um, as you know, today is International Moon Day and I cannot think of a better way to commemorate the day than what we'll talk about in the next hour. So in addition to International Moon Day today, July 20th, as you know, is also the anniversary of the 1969 moon landing. And so on this day, 54 years ago, the Apollo 11 crew became the first humans to set foot on the lunar surface. To celebrate this historic event, we are excited to be joined by an amazing group of panelists who will share 21st century space science, including NASA projects that we can all participate in. This event, tonight's event, will kick off a series of Do NASA Live online event, Do NASA Science Live online events. And so from Apollo to today to Artemis and the science that is being done by NASA today, we invite you to turn your curiosity into impact through NASA science that we can all be a part of and do together to accelerate science and scientific discovery about the amazing natural world that both surrounds us and includes us. And the team from SciStarter invites you to come visit us anytime online, um, SciStarter.org, to find, discover, and try projects from astronomy to zoology and everything in between. You can always, there's, everything's free open source, but you can also create your own free account um, to check out the ecosystem from projects, events, trainings, blogs, podcasts, and much more got some foundations of citizen science, free online training, you can earn badges, as well as explore and engage after the foundations, um, additional free online training and badges for any, any age. And as many of you know, the SciStarter.org education page, we have education, um, an education page dedicated to projects for any age group. And so without further ado, let's hear from our amazing panelists uh, about out of this world lunar science. And so I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to welcome and turn it over to Chip. 
Hi, this is Chip Shearer again from the University of New Mexico, and I'm just delighted to be here on the 54th anniversary of Apollo 11. Uh, 54 years ago today at 4.17 p.m. Eastern Time, Apollo 11 uh, limb touched down in the Sea of Tranquility. So just a few hours ago, 54 years ago, at 10.39, uh, Neil Armstrong opened the hatch and made his way to the lunar surface. And he and his uh, companion, Buzz Aldrin, spent 22.5 hours exploring the surface of the moon adjacent to the Apollo 11 uh, limb. Could I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Is it showing up? Yeah, it's showing up now. Great. Thank you. Um, to just to point out that Apollo 11 was the start of an human exploration of lunar surface that ended with Apollo 17 only three and a half years later. So if you came in uh, as a freshman following Apollo 11, the whole Apollo program to the surface of the moon was over before you graduated from high school. It's amazingly short lived set of missions, but obviously a real historic adventure for humans. Uh, what I'd like to do rather than focus on giving you a history lesson of Apollo 11, what I'd like to do is provide you with some information with regards to the giant steps that were made to get us to Apollo 11 since the uh, Kennedy uh, presentation to take us to the moon in 1961. Then what I'd like to do is show you the incredible evolution of the Apollo program and its surface operations during that only three and a half year period of time. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the Apollo legacy and how this really directly applies to our future space exploration via Artemis. Next chart. Next chart. There we go. Uh, this is just you know, a quote from John Kennedy from 1961. And from 1961 to the middle of the summer today in 1969, there were incredible growth, technological growth. And this is illustrated in this little cartoon to the left, where uh, the Mercury program started in 1961. And you can see it had a really small crew vehicle. Uh, it contained one astronaut. That evolved to Gemini uh, missions that contained two astronauts. And then finally, as you can see, the giant spacecraft that took three humans to the moon over uh, that three, probably almost four years. Uh, also, you can see to the left, uh, of that little diagram, the lift vehicle for uh, Mercury to the lift vehicle for Gemini, and again, the giant lift vehicle uh, for the Apollo crewed vehicle. And again, isn't it amazing that just over this really short period of time, we were to start from a space, from not a spacefaring nation, to a spacefaring nation with great capabilities. The next chart, chart. The next chart uh, is I just really want to show you during that period of time what the capabilities were with regards to how they evolved during the Apollo program. Again, that three and a half year period of time. The diagram to the upper left, the photograph from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, a great image that illustrates the where the limb was. If you look closely, you can see footprints of the Apollo astronauts as they did some surface analyses and sample collection. And they essentially, the distance they made was approximately 50 meters. That's that, that, that bar there to uh, Little West Crater. That's as far as they went. Uh, and then Apollo 17 
with the aid of a rover, uh, you can see the distance that uh, the Apollo 17 astronauts did in uh, at the last mission with this rovering capability traveling many kilometers. Uh, one exercise that I sometimes like doing with my students or like giving when I give a talk at one location, uh, I'd like to provide maps of the local areas that really illustrate the traverses that the different astronauts and missions uh, went on. And you can see in the lower left, the traverse from one end of the building to another end of the building where again, Apollo 17 took us a great distance across. Next slide, please. Also, a real capability from Apollo 11 to Apollo 17 is precision, precision landing capabilities. Apollo 11, primarily for safety, purposes, and again, this was a G mission, landed in a Mari plane, uh, and be be because of the landing capability precision. However, by the time we got to Apollo 15, 16, and 17, uh, precision landing became extremely good, and you can see that allowed us to go the regions that could have been fairly dangerous during Apollo 11, but Apollo uh, 17 landing us in the Taurus Littoral Valley, surrounded by mountains upwards of eight to 9,000 feet. The next chart shows that we also did substantial work with sample collection and the sample collection evolved in terms of the tools we used and the mass of samples we were able to collect. The upper two samples just illustrate that, you know, during, a, during a Apollo 11, we shoveled and collected some regolith and we collected individual rock samples. However, as Apollo evolved, we collected a variety of special samples placing samples, again, in these sealed vacuum containers. Uh, these range from fairly tiny several inches to two feet long tubes uh, that very recently we opened one of these during as part of the ANCSA initiative. That's the Apollo Next Generation Sample Initiative. Samples were collected in the shaded regions uh, next to boulders, and we also had several deep drill cores that were able to penetrate the regolith. Could you start the video? The next video just illustrates operations on the surface of the moon by Apollo 17, collecting samples within the Taurus Littoral Valley, and you'll see Gene Cernan uh, eventually, I guess we're getting a little stuck, it's really kind of slow, and Gene Cernan is pounding in uh, what's called a double drive tube to collect regolith from probably a meter in depth. And what he'll do is he hammered that in, pulled it up, separated out into two drive tubes and placed one into one of these sealed containers. And this is one of the containers that, again, we opened 50 years after Apollo, and it had never been opened or studied in the past. The next chart, next chart. Oh, great. Uh, having the mobility and long-term capabilities to survive on the surface of the moon allowed our astronauts to do incredible amounts of geology. Uh, the image up in the upper left was from a photograph taken by Apollo 17, and this is a pyroclastic deposit in Shorty Crater, and the orange soil that you see there is a pyroclast, our orange pyroclastic glass. The uh, imaged in the bottom left-hand corner is a boulder that slid off the uh, the uh, north massif 
that uh, there's a little image of the, the astronaut standing next to that boulder is Harrison Schmidt. And he was the only geologist and scientist on the surface of the moon. And he put together geological maps and geological information from these two outcrops. Next chart. Next chart. Yep, it's it's up. I think there must be a delay. Sorry, everyone. Oh, that, that's okay. This <laughs> just is a diagram that really illustrates the evolution of surface capabilities. And this is with regards to the number of EVAs that astronauts were able to participate in, starting with one EVA during Apollo 11, all the way up to three during 15, 16, and 17. The chart next to that are the number of hours astronauts spent in activities on the surface of the moon. Again, by the time we went from two and a half hours for Apollo 11 to Apollo 17, we were almost on the surface or the astronauts were on the surface approximately 25 hours. This was enabled by the EVA distances we were able to travel, you know, again, 500 meters to more than almost 40 kilometers. And again, the sample mass also improved significantly uh, from Apollo 11, where we collected, where 20 kilograms of sample were collected, all the way up to almost 120 kilograms. The next chart. So how does this help us the Artemis missions and what science has been done since Apollo that helps us. Uh, from the samples returned, we have developed a number of hypotheses from the Apollo samples, ranging from a giant impact origin from the moon, uh, a lunar magma ocean that was a primordial melting event on the moon that produced the core, the mantle, and the crust during this melting event very, very early on the moon. And this, this sort of process has been extended to other terrestrial planets. And then finally, another hypothesis that was developed from Apollo was this heavy late bombardment in which the large basins that you see on the moon were all produced over a limited amount of time. And also one has to extend that, that these large impact basins probably also existed on the earth during a period of time where earth, where life was uh, originating and slowly evolving. The next chart just illustrates the usefulness of uh, observations from our orbital abs uh, assets, our current orbital assets. And for example, this is some imaging put together in a video made from LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbital Imaging. Could you just start that? And this is diving a video, again, diving into the Taurus Litcho Valley. This is kind of slow. Uh, and again, illustrates the sort of detailed information that we now have to further explore the moon. The next chart. Yeah, we, we, we can go to the next chart. The next chart just illustrates the wide range of instrumentation that we will have available for Artemis. Uh, these instruments can be extremely large, like shown. Can we go back? These instruments can be extremely large, as shown as shown from this uh, this image of a synchrotron beam line. And again, back, uh, what you'll see for scale is a parking lot with individual small cars associated with them. 
and and there are so many more sophisticated somewhat smaller instruments but none of these instruments can we take uh, on any spacecraft either uh, yeah, you can see the parking lot with holes and the next chart just illustrates when the Apollo sample, when the Artemis samples are returned. Next chart. And what you'll see here are two of the same images. This is one of the samples that we had uh, had been imaged during the 19th. 1973, uh, five, and that X-ray image provided us a little detail what was in this core. Uh, back again, please. And and this these were X-ray images that we utilized uh, or that were utilized to look into these these no nope, back to. They were utilized to look into these cores before they were opened. As part of the ANCSA initiative, as part of the ANCSA initiative, we use X-ray uh, computed tomography, yep, to look at these samples in much more detail before we open them again two, three years ago. Can we go back one slide? Yeah, it just clicked the video that's there. And this just illustrates rather poorly, uh, but it illustrates that the X-ray computed tomography allows us to look in much more detail into the sample and provides us a lot more guidance into what's in the interior uh, that, and gives us a strategy for doing the curation of this core. And we use these for both the core samples that we examined. In addition, we developed during the ANCSA initiative a wide variety of tools that will be used for Artemis to open up these sealed containers to direct gas from them. Uh, we, we produced a gas manifold or this core sample vacuum container to extract the gas. The next chart just illustrates one or most valuable resources for the future and the approach we use to link Apollo with the Artemis generation. Uh, on your left is a meeting of our ANGSA team, which included a wide range of undergraduate students, I think some high school students and graduate students who participated in the science. And then they also got to meet and work with Harrison Schmidt, uh, Apollo 17 astronaut and Apollo 17 geologist. And, and Jack now is 87, uh, but he is still carrying the banner for Apollo and passing it on to the Artemis generation. Also, you can see to your right how the diversity in the planetary community and the planetary sample community has changed dramatically with the photograph in the upper right-hand corner, uh, curators at the Johnson Space Center curating the Apollo uh, 11 and 12 sample and down in the bottom right corner, our current cure will be curating the Artemis sample to return in three years. The next chart just 
illustrates, again, one of these fire fountaining outcrops uh, from Apollo 17 with the orange glass and this was 17 astronauts and the individual glass beads or pyroclastic beads uh, show a wide range of textures ranging from glass to composite sort of beads uh, that you can see in the middle to very complex We're in the process of doing in terms of a citizen scientist program if you click click that video This illustrates a, again, an XCT image of one of these uh, rocks that we collected from this core. And as you can see, there are a variety of gla or beads, glass beads, volcanic beads scattered through this. And I, our idea for a citizen scientist program is to provide a number of slices through this, uh, these various samples, make them available to the community for them to look at shape, texture, morphology of these various glass beads, which are critically important in reconstructing the volatile eruption or the uh, the volcanic eruption of uh, on the surface of the bone. And finally, the last chart This is my one of my favorite images from Artemis One, and it looks back at the Earth Moon system, really illustrating, you know, we we are together in this big big enterprise and invited to participate in some level in this exciting exploration science space economy uh, adventure. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Chip. That was great. And now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Mark. Hey, uh, I'm so busy chatting with everybody. I uh, forgot to unmute. Hey, thank everybody for being here. Chip, thanks for those cool videos. And I had no idea that, that uh, Tomography was going to be such an important part of the analysis and it makes perfect sense. And just thanks for being here. We're really looking forward to your project and also, Aaron, to your project and, of course, to returning to the moon. So, uh, my name is Mark Kushner. I'm the citizen science officer and I'm an astrophysicist. And I got into this because I did a lot of science by myself for a while. I worked at NASA now for more than 15 years. And I just discovered it's way more fun when you do it with friends. So now uh, I have the honor of, of helping foster citizen science and uh, connect volunteers to scientists, scientists with volunteers, and just do more science together. Next slide, please. So I'm going to just give you a one quick summary of what we do at NASA. Sometimes people call it citizen science. Sometimes people call it participatory science. Um, it's open to everybody from around the world. And I'm so happy to see folks have joined us on this call from, from around the world. Uh, that's how we like it. Uh, next slide. Uh, NASA works now with more than 2 million volunteers from 167 different countries. Uh, and uh, people bring all kinds of interesting passions and talent. It's really fun to get to know uh, our volunteers, getting to know you on this call. Uh, and um, it's, you know, the most fun, I think, is really when I hear about our volunteers who are getting to know one another. Like uh, they'll meet up with each other when they go traveling and, and send me a postcard. That's so cool. Uh, next slide. We have 37 projects currently open to the public. They're from every different field of science. I know y'all are interested in the moon. I love the moon. Uh, NASA does a lot of stuff uh, in earth science, uh, astrophysics, planetary science, heliophysics, uh, and and all of those disciplines have citizen science projects. So does the, the uh, biological and planetary sciences division. And you'll hear more about that from, from Amy Paddle. 
Anyway, all of our projects are at science.nasa.gov slash citizen science. I'm putting that in the chat, gov slash citizen science. And, oh, Trevor beat me to it, way to go. Uh, so uh, come there, check them out. If you have um, a laptop or a cell phone, that's all you need to do about 23 of the projects. So a uh, good starting place is to look for those projects that have the little hug icon, kind of looks like a gingerbread man. Um, it's right next to the name of the project. It's a good place to start. All it takes, I know you're talking to me now, so I know you have a have what it takes to, to join those projects. Next slide, please. Um, NASA's projects, NASA's volunteer projects, the projects on that screen are held to the same rigorous standards as any NASA science project. What that means is that when we ask for your help to do research with us, it's because the project can't be done without you. So we've got lots of tools at NASA. I mean, we have spaceships, right? We have computers, we have graduate students, we have all kinds of, of, of tools, but nothing beats having humans for, for these projects. These are projects that rely on uh, sometimes they rely on the location of our volunteers. Like we might need you to take a photo from somewhere where it's awkward for a scientist to go. Uh, we might need you uh, to look at a data set that we tried to analyze with computers already and we've done our best and there's still these weird cases that, that we can't make sense of. Uh, but crucially, we're relying on human curiosity and ingenuity, the ability to see something interesting and just dive in. You know, uh, people often ask me, uh, well, why can't you do all of this with uh, AI? You know, we have got chat GPT now, why do you need humans? And chat GPT, you know, uh, it's great at writing, um, I don't know, high school level essays, but it doesn't have curiosity. It can't see something interesting and follow up on that with the passion of a scientist, with the passion of a volunteer scientist. And nothing beats that. Next slide, please. Here's a list of some of the stuff that volunteers have found. If you've already been working on our, our volunteer science projects, thank you. These might be some of your discoveries. I'm gonna read them. Okay, here we go. The TP tent special signature from lightning at 15 to 30 megahertz. Star forming regions called yellow balls. A rare system, planet transiting system. The first extreme TV's outdoors. Zika virus and Peruvian cemetery base. The oldest white dwarf debris disk. That's that. The Dipper Star Phenomenon, the Peter Pan Disc Phenomenon, Exocomets and Kepler data, Kepler data, the Meyer family of comets, transit, most of the known comets, most of the known ultra cool brown dwarfs. Do you hear those mosts? We are dominating multiple scientific fields. Uh, every single known example of extrasolar material, 400,000 Martian seasonal fans, 283,000 emperor penguin nests, 9,120 candidate near Earth asteroids. That number is out of date, should be bigger now. Seven meteorites and one new kind of aurora named Steve. And that is a coin uh, in Canada, a real coin in Canada with a picture of Steve. It's this purple uh, pattern you see in the sky discovered by NASA volunteers. Next slide. Don't make me sing again, but I would sing about this because it's so cool. More than 450 NASA volunteers have become named co-authors on refereed published papers. So more than 2 million folks participate and whatever level you want to participate at works for me. Some people get really into it and they make big contributions and they end up writing papers with us. Super proud of that too. And they're all on this website right here under publications. Next slide, please. Good way to get really deeply involved. Again, if you want to just uh, check it out, you know, sniff around that page, science.nasa.gov slash citizen science, dip your toe into one of them, dip your elbow into another one. That's great. Um, if you want to spend your whole life doing these, that's also great. And the fun way to do that would be to join one of these projects. Uh, at least 12 of them have a regular video cons like this with their volunteers. So uh, check out one of these and um, yeah, and Alex is asking in the chat, how do you become a co-author? The answer is you, you hop on one of these calls and you hop on a lot of these calls and writing a paper generally takes, uh, you can't do it in, it in less than like three or four months. So it's a big project, it's a long commitment, but a lot of folks are doing it, sticking with the projects, getting to know the team, um, 
people are writing code, people are going on, going to telescopes, people are going to uh, polar regions. Um, there are all kinds of ways to get involved and uh, just dive right in and, 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 and sniff around. Uh, next slide. And people are leveraging these projects. They're turning them into si careers in science. I keep on hearing more and more stories of how people have changed their major in, in, in college to, to science. People have applied to jobs and in science. And, um, and like, if you're gonna apply for an internship uh, in science and you tell them, hey, I've already been working on science because I did a, a citizen science project, uh, that helps a lot. <sighs> there's the QR code, there's the website. Enjoy the next presentation. It's, it's gonna be really cool. Thanks for being here, everybody. I'll be in the chat. Oh, it's so exciting. Thank you so much, Mark. Great stuff. And now we'll turn it over to Aaron. Hi, everyone. Um, it's an absolute joy to be talking with teachers because you have the number one most important job in the world. Um, and uh, so I hope I can uh, introduce you to a new idea, a new citizen science project here that should be useful, um, engaging for your students. And uh, so um, I'll tell you uh, what we're working on. It's the, we've got a beta program now and the, the actual public release will be August 1st and you'll be able to get involved with the beta program immediately. I'll give you a link at the end of this uh, little talk. Um, a little bit about me, I'm Aaron. I work at NASA JPL. I do a bunch of things there. Um, I drive the Curiosity Mars rover and operate the arm. I'm also uh, helping to operate the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. Um, and most of the rest of my time is spent doing things with planetary imagery, um, predominantly the moon. And I work with uh, an organization, a, a project called Solar System Treks. Solar System Treks is a bit like Google Maps for the solar system. Um, it's a great way to uh, get familiar with your planetary neighborhood. Uh, and I totally recommend it if you want to go look at the surface of Marn. 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 <laughs> Marn is halfway between Mars and the moon. <laughs> um, Mercury, Venus. Anyway, lots of planets. We've got them all on Solar System Trek. Uh, so Solar System Trek and me um, applied to uh, NASA Rose's Citizen Science Seed Funding, and they were generous enough to support us to get this project rolling. Um, so what we're going to be doing with Moondiff is comparing, oh, actually, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I've got a picture here on the left of what might look kind of bland, but it's actually really exciting. This is the moon from Earth, and you'll see there's a bright spot um, kind of to the left side of the image. And that bright spot is an explosion from a meteor impacting. And this is actually probably pieces of Halley's Comet. Um, and the reason I'm showing this is just to, I, I really want to disabuse everyone of the notion that the moon is like a cold, dead place. Uh, it's super dynamic. There's all kinds of uh, geological processes. And one of the biggest ones, um, there's things like landslides, there's probably um, collapsing lava tube caves. Um, but maybe the biggest one is these impact flashes, these, these um, meteorites that hit. And if you just watch the moon from Earth, you can see several of these every month. And um, NASA's had projects uh, to, to watch those. But from Earth, we can't really tell uh, exactly where they hit, and um, we also miss a lot of them. And fortunately, we've got tons of imagery of the moon from recent times and going all the way back to even before the Apollo program. So what we can do is compare images of the moon from the deep past and from now, um, and we can look at differences. And so that's what Moondiff is going to be doing. We're um, leveraging the power of volunteers to compare those images. And we're finding changes, natural changes. And we're also looking for um, human caused changes. Uh, there's some spacecraft hardware. There's actually a couple of items of spacecraft hardware that are um, we're not really sure what happened to them. Um, and so the, the most interesting one to me, I think, is actually the Apollo 11 um, lunar ascent module, which is the top half of the lunar module that brings the astronauts back up into space. We're not actually sure if that's still in orbit around the moon or if it might have hit somewhere. So there's a chance we could find that. Um, and then, of course, in this new era of exploration, we have lots of countries sending tons of missions to the moon. 
Um, many of them land, and when they land, we generally know exactly where they are, but sometimes it doesn't work out so well, and then you need uh, to compare images to see where, where the impact was. Next slide, please. Um, so this is what we've built. Um, the user logs in, and uh, this is, video is just going to show what it's like when you go to the Moon Diff site and compare images. So we're flashing back and forth between an image from, I think, 2009 and something like uh, 2018. And these are both from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And so the user um, can control a lot of things about how these images are displayed, and they can pan around and zoom in. Um, a big part of this is that the, the user gets to decide how to explore. Um, and so this user has just noticed a difference between these two images. See where that crosshair is? There's a new crater that's appeared. Uh, and so then they'll mark this crater with a little polygon to report it, and uh, it'll be submitted to the database, and they'll write a little blurb about what they saw and um, select a classification, whether they think it's a piece of hardware or a new crater or what. And then um, this will all be stored. And then we have lunar experts, which will um, go through all the data that's come from the uh, volunteers. And particularly, they'll look at places where multiple volunteers have marked the same thing. Um, so yeah, so that was two images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Next slide, please. Can I get the next slide? Oh, uh, oh yeah, you got to play it. OK, thank you. Great. Um, so we can actually go quite a bit further back in time. So what you're seeing compared here are uh, two images. One of them is from 1967 from the Lunar Orbiter. And the Lunar Orbiter mission was sent to kind of pave the way for Apollo to get a feel for what the landing sites uh, might be like. And um, oh, can we go back to the video? Thanks. Yeah, great. Um, and oh, yeah. So I'll, I'll just keep talking. Um, so what we actually see here is when we go look back to before the Apollo missions, we can actually see Apollo hardware showing up on the moon. So um, this is what it would look like uh, when a user draws a polygon around Apollo 14. So the, the bright circular object um, is the Apollo 14 uh, lunar lander, the descent stage. And then um, you can actually see uh, some black lines, which are the um, the paths of Apollo astronauts uh, Edgar Mitchell and Alan Shepard, and they they made these paths towing a cart uh, to and from places. Um, and then you can also see on the very left edge of this two bright spots, and that's the uh, the ALSEPs, the the lunar surface experiment packages, which have um, some. Uh, magnetometers, seismometers, all kinds of science. And um, so, you know, we can use this tool both to detect these changes and also just to expose people to the fantastic stuff that you can see if you stare at the moon. And one other thing I want to mention is that these old images from 1967 are actually here because of a volunteer project, of a citizen science project. They they came back from the lunar orbiter and they were stored on magnetic tapes, which kind of um, got lost in the archives of NASA without any plan to digitize them or pub publicize them. Of course, in 1967, nobody could imagine that this would be available on the internet, right? Um, so there was a team of volunteers called LOIRP, the um, Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project, and they uh, painstakingly took all these tapes, uh, these magnetic tapes and pieced them together and they were able to um, create a digital version of everything that the lunar orbiter saw. And what's magnificent is that this 1967 imagery is um, actually almost as good as the stuff that we're taking today. Some of these low passes that they flew over the moon have a one to two meter resolution. So each pixel is you know, one to two meters. And that means we can see um, you know, the typical new lunar crater is 10, 20, 30 meters. And so we can see all kinds of new craters. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we can't really 
do with computers. We can't easily compare uh, images from the lunar orbiter with images from the lunar reconnaissance orbiter um, because of the fact that you know there are these strips that are not aligned very well uh, because the lighting's different, the spacecraft geometry is different because there are a bunch of um, crosses on the images called Rousseau marks. So anyway, we really need the community uh, to help us out, and we need the human vision processing system to say, "Hey, that's an interesting thing." Uh, next slide. So you can actually join our beta test right now if you go to this site, uh, trek.nasa.gov slash moondiff. Uh, Moondiff.org also works. Um, and we're, we're in the tail end of the beta. Uh, we're actually going to go public on August 1st. Um, but of course, then uh, we'll be really excited to have you participate in the general availability. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, that's Moondiff, and I hope everybody enjoys interacting with the, the project. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Aaron. I know lots of folks will be signing up. That is great. Excellent. And then we'll turn it over to Amy. Welcome, Amy. Hello, everybody. Hi. Can you all hear me? Right? Good? Not unclear. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Paidolf. I'm the very proud director of education at Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in incredibly hot Miami, Florida right now, you can see behind me. Um, I am grateful for this opportunity to talk to you this evening. I'm here to talk about a program that we started in partnership with NASA called Growing Beyond Earth. This project was created and facilitated by us here at Fairchild in partnership with NASA. And I'm excited to share with you how your students can help support NASA's science mission directorate and the science uh, and help science mission experts, Dr. Joya Massa and Trent Smith at Kennedy Space Center. Next slide. So what is Growing Beyond Earth? Growing Beyond Earth is a classroom-based citizen science project um, funded by NASA Sci Act funding to support NASA's mission experts. It's designed for middle and high school students. And unfortunately, we have not yet expanded to elementary, even though we recognize that elementary school students can totally do this program. Um, this is a free program for schools in the US. And if you're not in the US, we can talk about ways to support this project. It is designed to advance NASA's research on growing plants in space. Um, GBE, Growing Beyond Earth, um, addresses NASA's um, identified challenges by expanding the diversity and quality of edible plants that can be grown aboard spacecraft. Um, on Earth, Growing Beyond Earth um, is also advancing technologies for growing plants in urban, indoor, and um, other resource uh, limited environments. Growing Beyond Earth is, a, is uniquely focused on real scientific research, enabling student citizen scientists to contribute data towards NASA's mission planning. Each school receives a fair child designed plant growth habitat that is analogous to what's on um, the International Space Station. Um, you can see in this photo that you um, on the left, the bottom image is astronaut Sharon Walker, who was on the International Space Station. Walker worked with uh, the Veggie System, that's the name of the garden on the International Space Station. Um, and she's working with that, taking care of some plants that they were growing. And at the same time, we have students here on Earth who are doing simultaneous experiments alongside um, in a growth chamber that mimics what you, so you can see on the top, that's a student in Hialeah, Florida, who is growing similar plants to what Sharon Walker is growing in a similar, you can see it's the same size, same shape, same lighting. Um, the only difference is gravity. And um, according to the plant scientists, that is not a problem because in the absence of gravity, uh, plants will orient themselves towards the light. Um, um, Fairchild and NASA scientists, Dr. Joy Amasa and Trent Smith train teachers to conduct the in-classroom Growing Beyond Earth experiments and students share their experimental data with NASA. So all the data that your students collect goes straight to the NASA scientists. This program has yielded incredible results, both scientific and educational. Next slide. Currently, we have um, over 450 classrooms, middle and high school classrooms nationwide. Um, more than um, across the world. We have across 19 time zones. We have more than 40,000 students participating in this since 2015, um, which supports current plant research on the International Space Station. 
And students are running experiments similar to the plant in, in the same plant habitat, testing new varieties and new techniques for growing plants. Um, students um, have an opportunity to present their results to, to NASA administrators and staff. I'll explain that in a second. Um, and the students' data is helping NASA develop growing protocols for the ISS. Um, next slide, please. Um, each year we provide the equipment free of charge um, while supplies last and all the materials to conduct a prescribed research study. Students follow rigorous research protocols created based on NASA's priorities in both Spanish and English. We, they have them available, all of our materials in both Spanish and English, and have the opportunity to grow plants in their classroom, which for us is amazing as a botanic garden, collect important, important data for NASA, analyze the results. And after their first trial, which is typically goes until around um, the beginning of uh, mid-November, around mid-November, um, the students are given an opportunity to analyze all of their data and the data of others um, and propose original research. So problem solve, design something, propose original research to conduct a trial two after the winter break. Um, at the end of each academic year, students have the opportunity to present their original research to NASA scientists, researchers, and administrators during a student research symposium that's conducted virtually um, online with breakout rooms. Um, students are able to pr present their, their experiments and have answer questions from the NASA experts. Some of the students take it even a step further, submit their work to professional conferences. We've had students go to the um, ISS Research and Design Conference, um, the American Society of Gravitational and Space Researchers. It's pretty cool. Um, um, you can actually check out some of the work that the students have been doing on our Twitter account, which is at Grow Beyond Earth, where students, um, it's a student and school driven Twitter um, um, feed where students are showcasing their work that allows us to get a glimpse into their classroom and also allows the scientists to be able to um, answer questions and see what's going on in there. It's pretty cool. Um, We've had incredible scientific results. We've tested well over um, 190 varieties of edible plants. Um, 10 top performing varieties um, were, uh, um, were uh, selected by NASA for further testing at their Greenworks lab at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Five varieties were studied on the International Space Station based on the data collected by the students. Very cool. Next slide. Um, and the educational impacts of this. So not only are the students actively contributing to real world research, um, teachers, um, we conduct um, evaluations. We have an external evaluator conducting evaluations. We ask for a lot of feedback, both qualitative and quantitative feedback. Teacher surveys indicate that GB improves STEM instruction in middle and high schools. Um, the program is uniquely effective in serving um, students from underrepresented groups uh, as defined by like race and gender and socioeconomic status. Um, through the program, we've be um, students have become more knowledgeable about STEM topics um, because they're doing math and there's some engineering and there's uh, biological sciences that are all ingrained in, in that. Um, We've seen um, increase in confidence when students are participating in STEM related activities um, and more interest in STEM careers. Um, students are also learning about the dietary importance of fresh vegetables for maintaining health, especially for long distance space travel. So I recognize that I am not a classroom teacher, but haven't been for a long time, I was, um, but we've pulled together a group of uh, ambassador teachers who are there to provide assistance in integrating the program into the classroom. So um, as part of that, everybody gets an opportunity to, to um, learn. Um, next slide, please. The program runs um, in the on the uh, according to the U.S. academic calendar, registration for the for this year's participation opens August 1st and it closes September 1st. Um, we do have limited resources, although we've never had to turn anybody away. Uh, we've always found um, money to be able to support the resources. The resources we provide are um, a, a growth chamber on all of the materials. It's about a $500 uh, uh, investment on our part for that. Um, 
teachers who do register for this program are required to go through a, a training. It's a virtual training, a live virtual training that happens in September every year. But all of that information, once you register, will be sent to you. It is required in order for you to receive all the materials. We need to know that people are you know, um, committed to the program. Um, like I said, the equipment is free, but it's limited, so register early. Um, if you're from outside of the U.S. and you want to participate, materials can be purchased at just basic cost from our manufacturing partner, um, but we can also help talk through that with you. Um, my contact information is on here. I encourage you all to reach out. I encourage you to take a look. Um, there's a lot of information on our website, which is www.fairchildgarden.org backslash GVE. And with that, I want to thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the time. Wow. Thank you so much, Amy. Amazing stuff. And I bet we've got lots of folks signing up. That is great. Excellent. And so everybody will be will be heading into the question and answer discussion time, but keep your great questions coming in the chat pod. Um, we also wanted to take a moment just to share um, even some more exciting things coming up on September 19th. Um, another uh, uh, do NASA Science Live. So we'd love to have you there. And we also, of course, wanted to thank everyone involved, first of all, NSTA for hosting and organizing this. And um, we were so appreciative for their online web seminars, as well as NASA and the Citizen Science Association and Starter. We couldn't do it without, without partnerships. So thank you for everyone who makes all of these um, events possible, as well as all the people who contribute to the projects. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, the SciStarter ecosystem, SciStarter.org, and you can plug into any free resources, projects that you want to get involved in. Um, we'd love to, as, as Mark said, science is more fun when we are all doing it together. Absolutely. So again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, in fact, I will, um, Flavia, would you like me to pass it to you to do wrap up and then we'll do q and I know we've got great questions being answered in the chat already. You know, why don't we, uh, why don't you moderate a couple of questions from participants to presenters, and then you can turn it over to me for closing. After eight o'clock, after we close on the SCA side, we'll have informal time for questions as well. But let's take a couple of questions now from the audience. Excellent. And I can ask the panelists too, were there any you'd like to um, chat about? All right, any additional questions? I'm scrolling up. Oh, Mark's got one. I've got one for Chip and um, for Aaron. So people asked, um, what's the main science reason for going back to the moon? I want to get your take on that. Okay. Um, there's I'm coming up, but you'll answer this much better than me. Okay, no, no, no problem. Uh, there are, there, we, we're going back to the moon in a different manner than we did with Apollo. Uh, this is with with uh, international partners. This is with uh, commercial sector, and the hope is to eventually uh, develop a space economy that involves the moon, the cislunar space, and Earth. That's one. So it's it's very much different than Apollo. We have so many more people and institutions involved. With regards to what are some of the important science aspects, if you remember that uh, Artemis 3 is, and maybe 4 and 5, are going back to the South Pole. This area of the moon we've never been to before. We don't know what, the, what, they, what it is uh, in terms of how it relates to uh, the Earth-facing side uh, predominantly Earth-facing side that Apollo visited. So there is ancient crust there, which we may not necessarily have very good samples of. So we'll have a better understanding of how planets differentiate. Also, we're going to go visit cold traps or permanently shadowed regions. So we fully understand what sort of volatiles and the volatile cycle and are these potential resources for human activities in the future. And then finally, the areas that we're going are adjacent to what's called 
the South Pole Aiken Basin, which is the largest basin on the surface of the moon and probably the most ancient recognized uh, basin on the origin of, on, on the on the surface of the moon and this sampling the sampling that lithologies of those lithologies associated with this basin may provide us a better understanding of what this uh lunar cataclysm was and what sort of age ranges it occurred because if there are certain age ranges if it occurred at 3.8 3.9 this may give us some suggestions that there was some movement of the outer planets which may have caused the influx of a wide range of outer solar system materials into the inner solar system Maybe I'll just uh, pitch in a couple of the things that get me really excited about lunar science. Um, I mean, first of all, it's, you know, there are a lot of things about geology on the moon that are the same as geology on Earth, but it's a little bit easier to tell what's going on, actually, because there's no erosion, there's no atmosphere, there's no biosphere. Um, and so when it comes to things like big flood basalts, um, you know, we think we probably have some giant volcanic eruptions in Earth's past. Uh, but they're a little harder to see here, but on the moon, they're really, they're really laid bare. Um, and then impacts, you know, from the moon diff perspective, one of the, I didn't really say why we're so interested in figuring out where the impacts are and how many impacts happen. Um, and one of the main reasons is that um, <clears throat> we, for much of surfaces in the solar system, the only way we know how old they are is by counting craters. Um, and so we want to know what's the flux of space rocks? How many space rocks are there hitting the moon? And that can help us figure out things like, you know, on other moons of Saturn and Jupiter or whatever, um, it helps constrain uh, those ages and just learn about the solar system in general. But then once we actually get there, you know, then you have these samples that you can bring home and actually uh, age date Chip, that should be possible with Artemis, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, we're you know we're we're looking at uh, sample sizes uh, that we can date and trying to build that into the Artemis architecture to be make sure we can bring the proper sample size and the proper lithologies home with us. Great. And I'll, for our housekeeping, for folks' um, certificates and surveys, I'll pass it to Flavio. And we may, we may still have time for Q&A, so stay tuned if you want to ask more questions. But I'll pass it over to Flavio for his end of seminar housekeeping. Thanks, Flavio. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jill. Well, thanks, everyone. I want to thank all of our presenters, uh, Amy, Aaron, Jill, Chip, Mark, and also to Trevor and Roland, who are helping on the chat window. Uh, we also uh, want to make sure that we thank you, our participants. You are so engaged in the chat window. We have so many people representing different countries from around the world uh, and here in the United States. Thank you for joining us tonight and make sure that you join us again in a future program. We're going to be sharing that link about the survey in just a moment. So hang in there. I have a couple more slides to close up. We need to uh, know what you think about the program and how we can make it better in the future. Remember the collection that I shared with you earlier today. I'm gonna to share uh, the link one more time for you, the collection. Remember it has uh, links to the slides as well as a number of links were provided by the presenters. So make sure that you check that out as well. Consider NSTA for your future web seminars. Here are our list of web seminars coming up in August and September. As we mentioned before, the next science update is August 31st. We're going to be learning more about the eclipse doubleheader that is coming uh, and visible from the continental United States, uh, Mexico, and Canada in the, uh, next, later this year and in April of 2024. I want to thank the NSTA virtual learning team for all their support of NSTA web seminars. I want to remind everyone with this slide that together we are NSTA. So again, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And with this slide, we conclude the program. Emily, can you turn off the recording, please?